Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for all your patience. Um, if you're still standing, can you try and uh, find a seat in the dark, uh, if, if possible? Um, uh, you might not be able to see us anymore. Um, my name's Liam Young. Uh, my partner in crime next to me in the shadows is Alexi Marfin. Uh, we run the um, SIARC uh, Fiction Entertainment Program. Uh, and really what the program is interested in is exploring how our perception of culture and space is really largely determined by the mediums of fiction and entertainment. Our political positions are informed by fake news. We live out our lives in the pixelated territories of video games. We escape into the thickness of a screen. And we write stories to write the world. And in this way, uh, storytelling is also a very critical act of design. So what we do in the program is engage the techniques of film, animation, and gaming to engage and visualize alternative worlds and tell new kinds of stories about the emerging conditions of the 21st century. So tonight we're going to go and join the graduates of this year for the premiere screening of some of their project work and then a panel discussion featuring um, some amazing people from the entertainment industry for a wider discussion on the principles of world building and visual storytelling and some of the methodologies around which a lot of the work that, that they do but also the work in, the, in this program is based. Um, so tonight is not in any kind of uh, form a design review, but rather it's a celebration of the work of an amazing group of 15 people that have produced across 12 months um, an extraordinary array of imaginary worlds, moments, and landscapes. And we're really going to discuss the value of these kind of practices at a moment where sometimes fiction is the most effective means to engage with the world that reality often struggles to grasp where, in a way, stories of imagined lands help us to visualize other possible futures that sit outside of one that often all too much feels inescapable. So although the medium for tonight is projection, um, these projects are not a collection of films, but rather an array of imagined worlds, some that are narrative-based, some that are explorations of gaming or environment design, or digital landscapes. And in parallel, on either side of this space, are two immersive experiences. Um, behind us, in front of you, uh, Leah Wolfman um, is presenting Cloud Plus Labs, where you can sign up for a VR data purification ritual, um, somewhere between a Korean spa and a psychic reading, um, but with VR goggles. Uh, and behind you, um, Michael Erler, is projecting an interactive experience called Ways of Seeing, where you can play the role of various machines in the city to see the world um, empathetically through the eyes and gaze of their algorithms. So it's a body of work that emerges when designers, artists, and architects parasitically occupy the spaces of uh, the entertainment industry and exist almost like uh, Trojan horses embedding those landscapes with critical ideas about space, culture, and the city. Um, and then we're going to go on this journey together through these landscapes for about 45 minutes or an hour, and then we'll move to a conversation with an array of extraordinary guests. Um, uh, we're very lucky that, to have everyone here. Um, so please stick around after the films, because we've moved straight into the conversation where we'll have um, uh, Anne Crabtree, um, costume designer for the extraordinary series Handmaid's Tale, will be joining us. Um, Claire L. Evans, um, artist and lead singer of the band and experience Yacht, um, is here. Jamin Warren, um, co-founder of video game arts and culture company Killscreen. Uh, we've got Brian Merchant who is um, editor of Motherboard's Vice, um, which Motherboard, which is Vice's science and technology outlet. Um, Patty Podesta, production designer um, on an extraordinary range of films, and, and most recently the series American Gods. Andrew Thomas Swang, artist and director, um, known for his music videos for people like Bjork. Um, we've got Keeley, who's the director of um, Kilograph, um, an amazing LA-based um, uh, creative visual agency. Um, and Timothy Williams, designer, animator for games, films, and music videos. Um, so it should be a fantastic conversation, so please stick around for the evening. 
Um, so let's all strap in. Um, the expedition is vast and wondrous and strange. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. Thanks. I thought we'd get started. Um, I really wanted to talk um, a little bit um, uh, bigger picture, I suppose, um, uh, because all of the mediums in which um, the, the range of people um, in front of us practice in, whether it be films, games, literature, or media, um, in many ways all imagine alternative worlds as a means to understand our own world and, and engage with it in new ways. And in this way, an exploration of these spaces of fiction or the spaces of media offer a really interesting way of looking back into a condition, a condition of the present and the everyday that in many ways had become so complex, ingrained, and familiar that it almost becomes rendered invisible. And sometimes it's, 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 it's work like you saw in the past hour or work that, that all of these people in front of us produce that can really act to um, uh, reframe our relationship to the world we think we already know. Um, and I guess I wanted to start the conversation with this um, question, the idea of how something like world building or lots of the forms of the storytelling that you guys all do um, can be used um, critically to address um, some of the urgent contemporary issues that we might face today. You know, the idea of world building as a critique um, I wonder if you guys had positions on that, and maybe you can touch on um, some of your own work or some of the work that you've seen in that context. Um, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, particularly in our studio, something like Carolyn's project um, that we saw, which was a, a hybrid documentary looking at uh, the sorts of people that get left behind in our visions of a utopian future, um, or even Claire's project that we finished on, um, looking at um, strange new relationships that we might form with a world of intelligent objects. Um, all of these kind of projects are trying to uh, use the techniques that, that so many of you are all versed in to um, take a bite out of these questions. Um, I wonder if you guys have any thoughts on that or how world builders might operate in that context. Is that too vague? Do you want me to pick on someone? Is that a good place to start? No. I'm looking at you, Patty. All right. Um, let me be more specific, perhaps. Um, uh, I won't pick on Patty then. Um, and um, just because you're next to me, um, we talked a little bit about this before, but um, your work on The Handmaid's Tale, for instance, um, constructing um, this uh, cultural, stylistic, and visual language for this um, dystopian world. Um, uh, really makes visceral the kind of questions that has been rocking this town across the past year, perhaps. Um, uh, um, uh, the gendering of, um, like, the, the, the gender issues that go along with this town um, uh, really seem to chime um, amazingly with the launch of Handmaid's Tale. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a bit about um, how you thought about constructing that world or at least some of the, the fashion objects of that world, the uniforms of that world, um, to start to explore some of those questions. Yeah. Sure. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say not one of you amazing cats hired a costume designer, so I'm free for your next amazing project. It was, it was interesting, it just took it, it took me by surprise. Anyway, are we extinct or? 
It was really, it was really crazy to see. There was not one. There was not one. Okay, so Handmaid's Tale, back to that. So, you know, um, I hate repeating myself from anything I've ever answered before, but I do want to say that a lot of the kismet that has happened in real life all over the world, not just in Los Angeles, but globally, it's kismet, it's magic, it's society playing out, you know, very dirty, ugly things to women and people of color and disenfranchised people. So that's just luck and, and horrible luck, in fact, with our president. So I will say that we've always wanted to tell the truth of what is in the DNA of now and not create a show I'm saying we, I've just left the show, so it feels sort of, I feel fraudulent <laughs> talking about it, but I want to move on. And so we, in the past, the past two seasons of The Hammy's Tale, we knew that there were many forms of this show, and we knew, and I knew, that I didn't want to repeat anything that had been done before, because who would be interested? And then the one thing that we all agreed on was, if you create something that is perhaps three years in the future, five years in the future, but it looks like now, and it looks, in my case for the costumes, it looks like uniforms or inventions of clothing. The way to get at people emotionally and have it resonate with them is to make it feel as though it's not abstract. Does that make sense? And so I really called upon early on my love of industrial clothing and my love of, you know, 1900s menswear and what I saw growing up in Kentucky and the South Midwest, um, because those are the workers. And a lot of you touched upon that dystop dystopic idea of the worker. And it only got more and more fueled throughout time, throughout two years, as a kind of personal reaction to what's happening right here, right now? It's a long answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wonder, um, <laughs> Bill, no. Um, uh, I mean, I wanna come back to that question of dystopia. I mean, we did see a number of um, either people or things being thrown or jumped off bridges um, in the past hour. Um, we did see some cautionary tales um, there are different times of futures, um, but sometimes um, the productive dystopia, um, as we were calling it in the studio, becomes a really interesting way of actually exploring um, some of these questions that we've started to talk about. And I wonder, Brian, um, in your capacity as um, editor on Motherboard, where you deal with a lot with speculative narratives or science fiction stories that come through, um, I wonder if you can talk about some of that process of editing and selecting some of these stories and what you find or connect with in the context of science fiction, why certain things resonate or are meaningful, why the dystopia is attractive or productive. Yeah, I like that term, productive dystopia. That's a, that's a good operative term for um, what we're seeing so much of right now. Um, and I think that we do live in, in kind of a moment where there's not only this sort of a glut of dystopia, but there is sort of a usefulness of dystopia. There is, that's a commonality I saw in these films tonight, is that a lot of them almost felt more pointedly like a social critique than speculative fiction. Like there, there's a few kind of far out um, pieces and um, you know, deeper far flung imaginings, but, uh, a lot of people seem really fixated on the, you know, the, the, the here and the now and exploring that by just sort of moving the goalposts, moving the context. And I'm seeing a lot of that. That's what my inbox gets flooded with now is stories about uh, not, you know, a hundred years from now, but, you know, three months from now. The, those goalposts are changing so fast that it seems that all, you know, the, our best minds can do to get ahead and to feasibly sort of make a speculation about the future is to, you know, say like, you know, set their stories in, in, in 2022, uh, which is a really interesting sort of parameter now. And then as a result, you, know, you don't get a whole lot of uh, utopian science fiction. You get a lot of stories about, uh, you know, uh, 
inequality and uh, AI run amok and uh, and science fiction is really an interesting vehicle to explore these things with just as these films showed us I mean I'm also thinking about uh, was it was it Carolyn's film about uh, sort of the in industrial decline and yeah, yeah uh-huh um, that one struck a chord with me. It felt like sort of a visual equivalent of a lot of the stuff that we do run on, on, on Terraform in that it, it, it's just kind of a sly tweaking of an already extant reality, right? It's those might as well have been, uh, you know, coal plants or, or you know, natural gas extraction plants. It, it's just sort of tweaking reality just enough to sort of, to sort, to sort of get us to examine a, a an already very troubled uh, reality right now, yeah. I mean, do you think there's something about, um, uh, I mean, a lot of the projects are trying to explore a position in relationship to emerging technologies, right? And we seem to be at a moment where um, a lot of these things that are coming at us are what I would I often describe as before culture technologies. And that is that we haven't yet developed our cultural capacity to form an understanding of what certain things might mean, like the ubiquity of um, uh, augmented or virtual reality, for instance, um, or automation, the driverless car, uh, machine vision systems. Um, all of these things have already arrived to a large extent, um, but our legal or cultural capacity to know what they mean or what they might, the implications of them um, is lagging behind, right? Yeah. Um, so therefore it becomes part of the role of the storyteller to fill in those blanks yeah. to a certain I, extent, right? Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. And actually conversely, interestingly enough, is a lot of these stories were kind of about um, more general uh, sort of phenomena that have actually, that we've understood for decades that, you know, that a volatile energy source like nuclear power could go bad and, you know, wipe an entire town out and call, cause untold, you know, amounts of uh, calamity, and yet we continue to use it. We know that towns spring up around uh, resource, uh, you know, centers where that's rich in coal, rich in wind or whatever, and then we develop around it and we move on. And it's interesting that so many of these films were actually about social phenomena that we really, sh you know, don't really have a whole lot of excuses for not understanding, even if the technological trappings change, uh, the way that we engage with them, you know, has, has not evolved in, in a significant way. So I think that's an interesting thing that this is explored, as opposed to, you know, there's a lot of sci-fi and speculative fiction about AI and about, you know, the Instagramification sort of of the near future, but I thought it was really interesting how Many of these stories looked at things like, you know, resource extraction in the first piece, the, which was I, I really thought was fabulous. Uh, really looking at sort of, you know, it, it's not really even speculative fiction. It is just a, again a new lens on 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 the reality of the present. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if um, and maybe this is for for Jamin uh, and even for Andrew, like if there are now new forms of perhaps. Um, uh, kind of immersive media and storytelling, either it's in a VR space or a game space, that can start to unlock new relationships to some of those more worn narratives of, of science fiction um, and some of those tropes of the dominant AI and things like that. Like, I wonder if there's something about um, the creation of new um, positions of empathy, um, not to rerun the empathy machine d discussion again, but um, just to talk about how the prevalence of certain game environments um, or um, uh, immersive experiences um, can actually start to explore some of these issues as well? Or do they offer something new, perhaps, that the traditional kind of screen-based mediums don't? I mean, we're living in okay. such a dystopic Different. world anyway that it's kind of difficult to spin a yarn, spin a new world. And I, I think a lot of the pieces are exploring uh, desire in humans and how it interfaces with the technological present. Um, and I, I, it's interesting to think that that's the small story or the small simile that describes a situation between a human and um, a, a strip mine or something like that. I mean, to go back into narratives that are recognizable and to really unpack them or really get at 
um, in a different way, in a, in a way that combines dance and, hmm. and machinery. Um, maybe that's actually what's missing from how to solve these things and not speculative ideas about, I mean, I love AI as much as the next person. So, and I can't wait till we can get rid of Trump and get back to that stuff, but maybe we can't do it this year. That's why, and I think that maybe it's representing a lot of that. Like the desire of what, of humanness. Yeah, I think just to bounce off that, I mean, um, technology, the new formats are just developing faster than we can even keep up with, you know? like. Uh, students two years from now maybe using technology that we never could have imagined. So I think to echo that, like, uh, what I find more interesting is, um, you know, the, the, the way that, the, you know, we're always going to be telling um, narratives, you know, retelling narratives, uh, you know, that we've been kind of thinking about for the past few decades, like you mentioned, like with these media. But I think what I, what I loved most about some of these pieces was the interweaving of folklore or myth or things like dance, like you know, other kinds of um, interweaving of, of other art forms or storytelling um, or even you know, indigenous stories to, to like, you know, forward the conversation no matter what the medium is, whether it's VR or you know, AI. Like, I, I think that um, we're gonna be constantly stunned every year what, what people are using to make their stories, but what stories they're telling I think is, is more important. Um, one of the things that I liked about the pieces as they relate to um, people who play games, there's like, there's an irony in, I think, the dystopias that were presented for the two pieces, the, for Dreamland and for Last Choices, is that there have never been, there's never been a time in human history where more people have played games together, and so those pieces kind of showcase this very private tragedy that happens when uh, people go on a journey to purchase a video game by themselves. Also, I do like in that futuristic environment, even though everything seems to be in at fingertips, you still have to like actually go to a place to mm -hmm. physically get a video game to bring back and play by yourself. I appreciate that note. But um, yeah, so I think like one of the things that's happening in the world of games is so much of what happens with play now happens in a social context. And so I think to kind of take what's happening more broadly and take some of the tropes around like the private, you know, isolated gamer and put those in um, a historical context around the, you know, Fukushima dis disaster or in a mythical context in the, in the sense of dreamland, I think was, was really unique and, and very special, and I think very, uh, very prescient. Yeah. I mean, uh, one of the, the great pleasures about um, uh, running this program in a place like this is that um, uh, we're able to kind of bring together a, a group of people from a whole range of different backgrounds. Um, and what we try and do is give them the space to, to tell the stories that they most connect with, right? And, and you saw that there are, you know, there are st stories of, a, of an immigrant experience in Los Angeles. There's a story of um, Iranian uh, folklore, um, uh, a story a story set in the Congo, um, uh, or uh, stories in, in Japan um, and in Fukushima. They're all very culturally specific narratives um, uh, created by people that connect to them, right? Um, uh, and I wonder if... Um, there are ways of, of thinking about these types of mediums and thinking about these types of projects and picking up on Andrew's point about a relationship to um, uh, cultural narratives um, as opposed to kind of the tech fetish that often comes with um, kind of heavy visual effects, worlds of visual effects. Um, I wonder if there's a way of thinking about that that, that may actually suggest um, alternative subject positions um, or even suggest kind of new or emerging subject positions. Um, and I wonder if these mediums and these kind of stories can help us move away from very binary ways of seeing the world and, and move away from conversations of utopia and dystopia. Um, and again, I, I, I think that you know, what um, we tried to do this year um, as well was, was to engage music and music video as a form, to engage dance, to engage um, uh, uh, history, myth, and folklore, and culture in ways that we haven't before, um, uh, and to explore much softer narratives, you know, not hard narratives like guy meets girl, guy meet, loses girl, guy finds girl again, but, but much more kind of abstract um, uh, pieces that just kind of fall upon you, I suppose. Um, and I wonder, but either Andrew or, or, or Claire, 
you know, the way that those, those same kind of media of either um, music, um, a music video or those contexts, um, you know, how they can operate in those terms that we're talking about larger world building projects and even when they're softer narratives. Okay, I have like a constellation of thoughts around this that may not be fully formed. Um, I think that music and culture, as you're referring to them, have an interesting commonality with kinds of media and technology that are being used in this program in that they are both immaterial. Um, you know, you can't point and say like, that's where culture is, right? It's this thing that's very sort of diaphanous. And yet it's also very much embodied and enacted regularly through, you know, object-based rituals and food and all these things that are very material. And so, and I've seen that a lot in these films is this contrast between incredibly material things, you know, the earth, rare earth minerals, the supply chain, like this the very sort of tactile and very real feeling thing, which is also a really, you know, challenging thing to do when you're building a world is to articulate the material reality of that world. And, not just like we know what the earth looks like, but what trash looks like, and you know what newspaper clippings look like, and all of those things I really admire when people do well because it does a lot, you know, to fill out the world of a story. Um, but yeah, this 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 contrast between the material and then the much more kind of evanescent technologies at play, like virtual reality and augmented reality, and I think there's this tension, maybe that's generational, that's happening where we're just constantly trying to like use the virtual to find the real and vice versa. I think in one of the films there was this question of the debate between the virtual and the real being the, the same as the d debate between life and death, which I thought was like a very grand statement, but um, very true. And I guess death is almost the ultimate material end. So that's the end of that constellation of thoughts. <laughs> Um, I mean, Andrew, I mean, even, even your own music videos, like, there are certain, uh, I mean, I, I guess we can also start to talk about um, some of the aesthetics of, of these worlds and, and starting to explore um, uh, to what extent do we need new aesthetics to tell new kinds of stories. Yeah. Um, and that's what I, I admire so much in your, in your own practice is really developing um, uh, a very unique and, and, and particular visual language. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, just to riff off what Claire was saying, like, I, you know, everyone here is a designer in some way, and so materi like the materiality of, and the material choices in every one of these films is, is, you know, communicating a whole set of values, whether it's real or virtual or trash or, you know, not trash or, I, you know, so like, I think when you make music videos or when you make films, um, when you're doing costume design, you're constantly deciding as a designer what what the material properties uh, of the world are, and th it's through those materials that you're communicating an entire set of idea ideas and, and values and political politics. And so, um, I think definitely, um, you know, uh, th those choices are so pivotal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe the uh, production. Uh, Patty, in, in terms of production, or even Anne, like, um, maybe we've already touched on that um, with Handmaid's Tale, but just thinking about those, like, the construction of, of a entirely new, potentially visual language that might be born out of an intense study of, of ancient mythology, but then is translated through a whole series of layers. But, um, you know, I mean, when we work on film, it, it, it never is something that has emerged newly born from under a rock. And it's always a history that is the culmination of everything that has come before. And I actually think we see that here um, quite a bit too. You know what I mean? It's sort of, I think it, what you frame out is as important as what you bring into the piece in regards to those descriptions. Um, and I and I see that happening here too, yeah. interestingly. Yeah, and maybe I mean Keely and Timothy the. The visuality of the digital is also just as um, critical as you know the costume choices someone might make or Andrew might make in his music videos, merging live action puppetry with with digital, right? Like, um, I think uh, we haven't really talked about it, but, but Corday, who, who made the first um, uh, film that you saw, also you run a, a, a visualization website where you cut out people of color to be used in architectural renderings, right? Um, uh, like, you know, the, the politicization of those visual languages, you know, no, no, no image we put up on the screen is neutral, right? Um, and a visual effects artist, an animator, a digital artist is just complicit um, in uh, the narratives around a work. Um, 
um, as a costume designer or a production designer um, uh, or someone who might claim that work for a particular political narrative, right? Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, the aesthetics of the digital and, and, and yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, I think I'm really, really struck by how distinct the styles were in each of the films that we saw. And they, they did apply um, to the narrative that was being, that was being crafted, um, particularly the second, which was almost seemed to be borrowing from uh, photography. There seemed to be this sort of Andreas Gursky kind of aesthetic, um, which was, was really kind of striking, particularly after you watch it for some time. Um, and it was less about the sort of fidelity of what we were seeing uh, and more about the kind of composition, even the way that you know, cameras seem to move through the space. They reinforce the sort of narrative. Um, and then uh, the one at the end that was you were referencing when the video game gets actually kind of um, grasped by the, the object, the way that we progress through the style of the, uh, of the scene from this kind of no tan to this kind of formed world, uh, again, it sort of reinforces. So it's like, less about this fetishizing of what is the future, what can we do with even 3D rendering techniques and more about you know, how can we combine these styles or lack of style in order to reinforce the story that we're telling. Uh, and you know, I think that's incredibly effective. Um, yeah, I think that like the, the digital styles that are being implemented in all of these spots, um, they're interesting because of course they're like so specific to the voice of the artist. I think that whether or not you were mentioning when you were asking the question about how complicit artists are when it comes to like the politicization of their own work um, and uh, the production artists and whatnot. I mean, I think that what we leave in our work and what we take out of it um, is so important because we're constantly like in marketing and, and advertising, trying to find ways to find that balance between um, what we want to show the world of how we view ourselves and uh, what we think that our clients are going to approve, of course. Um, there's that balance there between um, having conversations in the workplace about how much we show of uh, the realities of the, the world we live in. We do a lot of uh, jobs for like tech companies and, and we're trying to find that balance between you know, uh, what type of people we show, how we show them, the styles that we render things in order to make people feel certain ways. Um, it's a, it's a conscious effort, and even if you don't put that effort in, which I'm assuming everyone who worked on these um, pretty fantastic spots put a ton of effort in, um, what you don't add, what you're choosing not to add, is almost as important because it's so visible when you see that something is, is missing stylistically, something that could mean something more to the piece if it was there. Um, I think that you know we, we step away um, from imagery that is, I guess, um, hard to confront sometimes because we are afraid that it'll get a little weird. Um, and I think that that's what's so fantastic about some of these pieces is that they went pretty straightforward and face on into some pretty difficult ideas. You know, seeing somebody, especially like as a man of color, seeing uh, what looks to me like a fantasy world where you have this guy dancing, um, in order to like bring this, I guess, like robot to life, this this machinery, this world that's um, become so important. Like, just even that idea of seeing a world where Africa actually has like some sort of value um, is amazing. Um, I think that that stylistically, it's almost relevant sometimes when what you're saying is uh, is so much more important, and then the style just helps enhance that bit by bit. And uh, I think as long as we're not like getting in the way with style, then we're accomplishing exactly what we're supposed to. I mean, maybe, maybe um, it's interesting to talk a little bit about um, some of the pra pragmatics about what it means to make this type of work out in the world a little bit, because you touched upon questions of um, client projects um, or projects um, uh, in an advertising space versus you kind know, of music video content, which maybe is more liberating um, and potentially personal in terms of its means of expression. Um, and Keely, you obviously work um, 
uh, in the visualization of, of um, clients' visions or hopes for their futures, futures that they're about to spend millions and millions of, of dollars on. Um, uh, um, I wonder, or, or even Andrew as well, if anyone on the panel wants to talk about the nature of um, those different forms of production um, and what it means as, a, as an artist or practitioners um, uh, to, 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 have a, to navigate those, those two worlds and those different agendas and what, where the spaces for agency are. Do we want to talk about this in a yeah, Well, I mean, the, the reality is that a lot of the, the work that we've seen, these, these guys go out into the world now and right. um, have to start making their own projects. And Anne, and, and we, we were just talking about um, personal work versus yeah, um, yeah, larger scale question. kind of film work or TV work and what that might mean. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, a, it's an excellent question and it's something that you definitely have to reconcile. Um, and working with clients is, is kind of a dance. I mean, you, you have a, a sort of interpretation of what the vision is, uh, and then you, um, if you, you get it right and you engage someone in the conversation, you can, uh, you can really create anything together. So it's, it's really about getting inside of that, that kind of headspace and, and being able to, to move someone, because most people outside of this room can't see things the way we can. They can't see a picture. Uh, and I think that that I realized maybe a year ago, oh, wait, you don't see this. You know, we made this high fidelity rendering. Virtual reality has uh, sort of helped us overcome that so that people can actually feel an environment. But um, I think the most valuable thing is to be able to translate ideas um, and to take people on that journey just as a conversation before you even get to visualization or, or any kind of um, you know, further crafting of something. Uh, and that's a skill that we definitely you know, learn as architects from, from other, um, other kind of backgrounds, not just film production. But it's interesting. What, I, what I've learned in the last uh, three years, working on The Handmaid's Tale and Westworld, which are kind of giant uh, landscapes in which there are millions of opinions uh, and even working on a film just now with Dee Rees, who did Mudbound, who's a brilliant mind, um, who's trying to tell a new kind of story. You know, the thing that has always worked for me, if it helps anybody, is that you have to, you have to really communicate well what your intention is. And then you can't let your ego get bigger than the story in my, in my arena. You know, I'm a costume designer for money. And so, um, for money, I have to tell that story so truthfully that I don't, I don't step on any toes or any other egos. I can't go bigger than the writer or the director because it's not mine, right? I'm there to enhance what they're telling. But the good thing that happened, um, I've done this for over 28 years now, and it took me a really long time, maybe 25 years, <laughs> to figure out that if you're telling the truth, you're satisfied as an artist. You know, if you're telling the truth at the end of the day, there's great gifts in that for longevity. And Handmaid's Tale is one of those where I think because they didn't have time and I had to build everything physically like a factory to, to make all those clothes and to create sort of social constructs around and around the politics of the why of that story, if you're familiar with that story. Um, no one had time to break down the why because it's a TV show, you're in a hurry. But the, the blessing that came out of that as an artist, and again, it took two and a half years to get here, is that I did not study costume design. You know, I studied painting and Shakespeare, which makes no sense, but uh, but two museums, three, you know, in one year are going to have my work, and it doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to a corporation, or many, but it's my work, and it's art in a different way, in a kind of this kind of swimming, to to be able to celebrate truth, if that helps. Does anyone else want to want to hit that? Um, I mean, because I think part of this, this question, I guess, was um, also thinking about a question of audience. Um, 
Uh, I mean, a very practical issue for, 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 for some of the students now is thinking about where these works might, might find a home. Um, do, they, do they hit the film festival circuit? Do they live online? Are they gallery pieces? What's the next project and where does that go? Um, uh, Lara's project, for instance, is um, buried with, is, is a film fragmented and buried within Instagram um, that you follow through tags, um, hashtags and names and profiles. Um, the nature of audiences are changing in the same way that nature of platforms for getting work out into the world is changing. Um, just like TV, like I don't know if, if American Gods or Handmaid's Tale could have been made in the age of network television. Um, perhaps it needed cable to happen. Um, uh, the distribution of, of, of even your own video content, Claire and, and, and Andrew, um, uh, creates new opportunities um, to reach audiences um, in a way, I hate to use this word democratize because that's not really what it is, but the, the tools of both making work and getting work seen um, are much more open now, even, even the way that um, games are being distributed, Jamin. Um, uh, and, and of course, um, uh, Brian and just the creation of Terraform as a platform that can exist, like normally that would have taken the massive might and finances of a publishing house to make it happen. Um, so I wonder if you, you know, all of you or some of you can take a bite out of that just to think about how both platforms for the creation of content but also the, 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 the platforms for, for reaching audiences with that content is shifting and what that means for work, whether that's catastrophic or really exciting or just business as usual. I think there's been a, a huge emphasis in the last few years on what these things do for distribution and not enough emphasis on what they do for us creatively as a medium. You know, I think we've all heard a million times that it's a great time to be a musician because you know you can just make your music on your computer and just put it up on SoundCloud. But that doesn't mean that anyone's gonna hear it. I mean, emphasizing that and putting all of your effort into that aspect of it is, seems to me a, a fool's errand in this world because you know there's a huge signal to noise ratio to get through. Um, but there are so many more creative possibilities inherent in the mediums that we're not exploring as much. We're not like taking the time to look at the platforms and fuck with them. And I mean, I, that's why I love the idea of a narrative broken up over Instagram because that's, that's what we can do with this medium and it's totally different. And um, that's much more interesting to me creatively. And I think that ultimately that also leads to more visibility just because there's some originality there that's um, in of itself a story for what it's worth. Yeah, I I agree with that completely, and I don't you know I don't know I the same thing I don't know how much how different you know the landscape is in terms of fewer gatekeepers, more gatekeepers, how you know distribution models and what's uh, you know whether things are easier now, harder, or whatever that insane slipstream is. But I do know that people are more willing to sort of just kind of put their eyeballs on a wider variety of stuff, whether it's a narrative short film or like a weird Instagram fueled project or whatever, you know, if we, there's a, the, the threshold for experimentation is greater now, which is interesting. You know, we can run a really traditional sort of short science fiction story, you know, about robots and people go like, okay, that's cool. And, or we can write, you know, or we can, you know, embed one of these more experimental kind of uh, you know, CGI slash, you know, social network fueled. We built a Twitter bot that told the few, I mean, the, the, all of these things, people are now at a point where they're willing to sort of give equal credence to. And I think that's the most interesting thing. It's still hard to get your work out there, it feels like, anyways. It feels like that's still, you know, you're, you're I mean, the chance of getting through to to an editor or somebody who can, you know, you know, get the you know, get it in front of enough people is still tough. But it, I do think it's a more interesting landscape now. There's a lot more, you know, it's a lot more dynamic, more um, more interesting. There's a lot happening. On in, in, I actually think of it a lot like what happened to um, publishing with the internet and how it really became. I mean, there are readerships for all different kind, for a million different small things. And I actually think with Netflix, and um, I'm looking at the Netflix logo over there. And um, 
yeah. and apples coming up and all of this kind of stuff, that that is one of the things that's happened. There's all these, it's smaller, the expectations are smaller, readership, readerships, viewerships, um, and there's a lot more of them. But I also think that, as I've told Ian this, it, like projects come up and they go down, they come up and they go down, and it's just been, it's really volatile. And it's gonna be really interesting to see over the next few years, like, what happens with that? Like, I still think that good writing is the basis of it all in a certain way. And I think a lot of the, some of the projects tonight have really, really great descriptive um, writing at the, at the base of them that really makes a difference. So, funny, it comes back down to this over and over again. Mm. Yeah. You just have to make something good. Yeah. Oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just, I have a question. I mean, I wonder about AI. There was that one project that touched on it. And it was that, project, yeah. yeah. It was pretty, pretty awesome. Did the you do it? That was, it was cool. The, oh, the, 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 I think AI. you were talking about um, the, the, the film that was um, written and art directed by AI. Yeah. Is that right? Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Paul, yeah. Paul's uh, The Lake of Sex Hormone Chewing Gum. Which was um. awesome, <laughs> which is a great name for another band if you ever want to. Hormone. Uh, I thought that was a great, uh, a great, great, great piece. And I wonder how much AI is going to affect kind of the distribution and consumption of all these different forms of, you know, the sort of mass customization. If you talk about writing, how are people going to see your piece, or how are people going to kind of experience your your music? If that's going to kind of have an effect, um, it could be. Well, it already is having an effect, right? So, what what does that mean? You know, kind of in the future. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in a way that, um, I mean, uh, Paul's project um, is quite explicit about its um, use of, of, of AI in that project. He, he trained, trained the AI on um, the top 10 uh, Amazon books about utopia um, and asked it to generate its own utopian dream, um, which seemed to be an extraordinary cliche of the underground city and just kind of repeating all of these stories. And they're, they're, um, AI is, is, is exceptionally visible, but in someone like Vivian's project, which was the things, Valentine's Day in, in, in Things City, that entire city was procedurally generated. Um, and so much of the work that we do in this digital space, as, as I'm sure Timothy mm -hmm. and, and Andrew and, and everyone working, Jamin, like everyone working um, through some of these technologies know that like so much of what we do is actually procedural, right? Isn't, isn't actually, um, uh, you know, sliding pixels one by one across the screen. Um, uh, and, and Michael's project, you know, looking at the ways that these algorithms actually construct t entirely new readings of the world, right? A driverless car sees the city fundamentally different mm -hmm. to what people do. Um, to varying extents, um, uh, the, the AI or the, the, the machine behind the scenes is visible mm -hmm. or invisible. I suppose, right? I, I think that's why it's so interesting in forms of like a potential for, for narrative. I mean, we talk about, you know, the dystopia, virtual augmented reality and all these things, which are <laughs> devices. When you're looking at the kind of invisible, I think it has that ability to really put forward things like folklore and narrative. And it's kind of the, this construct. It was really coming out. It was pretty fascinating. Yeah. And just to go back to, to start to draw to a close, to go back to that question on, also, this conversation of aesthetics. There's certain um, uh, visual languages that you that, that you saw tonight, and that, that a lot of you work with um, through your own practice. That that is only possible um, uh, because some of these tools, like to to to, to hand model Vivian's um, uh, post-human logistics city, um, would have taken a decade, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, but you can populate that with a thousand Amazon boxes um, uh, just by kind of um, fiddling with a little script. It's, I mean, it's still fucking hard, um, but um, uh, it's not as hard uh, as, as or time-consuming as, as, as what it once was. Um, uh, so again, it, it just suggests that, you know, as we struggle for new aesthetic languages with which to visualize the future, some of these tools might be become more and more interesting. Um, and it makes you wonder why we're constantly seeing reruns of 1980s cyberpunk dystopias <laughs> in popular media. Um, I don't know, I, I don't think anyone here has worked on any of those. No, <laughs> Altered Carbons, Blade Runners, no, we haven't visited that. I, I, I shouldn't look at that on the screen at the moment. But uh, um, I mean, you know, the aesthetics of the future, just as a, as a question that closes, and maybe Brian, you have, um, 
thoughts on this as well. I mean, um, whether through Terraform or Brian has recently authored a, a wonderful book, The One Device, which is charting the history of the iPhone in this kind of icon of the future and actually where it came from and what it meant and how it was constructed. Um, you know, um, why I guess it's, it's also a very personal question you know, where, I, where I, in, in our own work we, we try and explore the, the subcultures around particular futures and technologies. Why do we rerun these same ideas? Why is it so hard to visualize what it could be as an alternative? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's I so ask this question to every panel. No, I'm, I'm really literally trying to get advice here. No, uh, it's great. No it's one so knows. funny that you raised that question, right? We were just, Claire and I, just before this, we're, we're talking that exact, you know, there's this new Cyberpunk 2077, this big video game that's multi-billion dollar production budget that it's going to one of these. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It does. No, it looks. It's, I, I thought it looked cool. Oh yeah, let's. The, well, no, 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 think. Yeah. I, no, no, go with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it, it looks cool. Sure. Yeah, I'll shit on it first. Let let's let me take this down real quick. Uh, it so it's it's it looks cool. Sure, but it's not. It's, it, it, it's not doing anything, it's not advancing the conversation, really. It's plugging into a nostalgia for a future that's existed for decades already, maybe 40 years, which is insane, that this is sort of the vision that we're constructing with the latest technologies, the latest interactive, immersive media technologies, video games, uh, as you said, are the, sort of the biggest, uh, you know, most immersive, most collective sort of uh, 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 sort of visions that we have to, to participate in right now, and what are we doing with it? With the latest big budget, we're we're making we're we're digitally reconstructing the vision of the future that William Gibson wrote in 1973. Um, so it's it, it it's it just feels a little reductive. And one of the things that was so great about so many of these is these are brand new weird futures, or at least flashes of them, uh, or we're getting steered towards them, uh, and we're seeing sort of uh, interesting interplay between, you know, the same kind of that effect of, you know, of the cyberpunk, which was sort of gritty, urban aesthetic, contra, high tech, you know, this, this the chasm of inequality and the melancholy and misery that causes. There's this the, one of the the visual texture of that film we saw tonight, uh, the the augmented reality, which was this mm -hmm. urban city that was mm -hmm. it was kind of dark and isolated and alone. But the the visions that she were she was able to plug into through augmented reality were beautiful and and transporting, and it yet it registered in this sort of purgatorial note that was uh, clearly neither. It wasn't straight dystopian and it wasn't certainly utopian. I mean, it was tragic ultimately. But that's, I think, an, a way to sort of start to create a future that doesn't rely on, on, on tropes or ideas or parameters that were laid out you know, you know, decades ago. So. No, I'm, I mean, I think you know, this has been a challenge in the game space for quite some time, which is that the people who are making games, like all their reference points are are the same, and I guess maybe that's, I mean, Cyberpunk 27, 2077 aside, I mean, I think what's interesting to me is, I mean, I think we have to reckon with the idea that we're going back 40 years, but there's another 40 years from now where this will be the source material, and that's kind of what I'm excited about. So if Cyberpunk 2077 is the last thing that I see in this universe, I'm okay with that. I hope that, I hope that we start to see more things like we saw on screen for the next kind of like generation. But I, yeah, I think we're kind of like having to live through someone finally making a photorealistic version of it to say that we're finally done. But I don't know, there's been like three Incredible Hulk movies, so. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'll just, I'll just add that I, I that that's 100% right. Like, I'm going to play the game. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it is, I mean, with Gibson, is that no one's really done a, a, a fair version of how great those books were. And I think that the tools are finally here, and that's why that stuff is coming around. There's, I don't know, seven or eight films planning, planned right now to mm. adapt his films again. And I think that mm. that's a big part of what we're seeing is, and his work also does, I mean, interestingly, a lot of what's here is that it's 
a world that we can recognize. We know that it's set in San Francisco in the future, you know, or mm -hmm. it doesn't leave behind the um, recognizable mm -hmm. um, geography of, of the world that we do recognize, and it just makes the problems mm -hmm. <laughs> of another millennium. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's part of, like, it's becoming a naturalized language. And so how we get beyond that. You know, I, I said to a famous director once who will go unnamed, um, I can't wait till people make films about what happens when all the problems are solved in the world, and I want to know what happens <laughs> after that. And he said, that can never happen. No. And I was like, wow, I mean, that's your answer to that. Like, that can never, that can never happen. So. But how, how much of that do you think is because, uh, I mean, we read great science fiction, like from Forrester, you know, and Gil Gibson, and it's something that we're reading, and it's impossible for us to, to see or visualize at a kind of certain fidelity level anything, um, because it makes us kind of like, well, there's that term about the future nauseous, you know, not being able to represent the future and the present, and if that's like a, a visual hurdle that we can't overcome, like you can write about it, and that's why there's always been great science fiction writing. But to, to see it is just like impossible. We somehow can't get past that. And maybe that's what's holding everyone back. Um, it, is, it is interesting that we seem to be getting closer, though, to, to being able to realize that stuff. I, the, yeah. the, um, that propaganda video is a great example of it. I mean, that's a credible you know, recreation or parody of you know, what, what, a, what a propaganda video produced by yeah. some, you know. I love that it, yeah. by the way, that it, it, it shows its own apparatus, which is the opposite of what propaganda does. <laughs> yeah. so, that, good work. I thought you did a really great job in the end of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was saying, maybe part of it is about, and it's one of the kind of conversations we have in the studio, part of it is about misreading. And when you have these new technologies and not being, not about fetishizing them, but about creating sort of cultural interpretations of those technologies for their not intended audiences. Right, the same way that we, like Rohini's film, it had Fukushima, the nuclear meltdown, reinterpreted as a, as a monster, right? As opposed to literally talking about, you know, or we had uh, smartphones talked about as a mining god, right? I think maybe that's part of the thing that's missing. That was a thing that existed in the 70s, 80s futures, where they looked at Japan as this rising superpower, and they were like, holy shit, let's mythologize that and collapse it with Los Angeles. No one's kind of done that now. They're just kind of rehashing that vision rather than rehashing the mindset that generated it. Maybe, I mean. Yeah, no, I mean, that seems to be a, a lot of, and, and, and the further along it goes, it just kind of feels more problematic. The further yeah. it goes, that sort of fetishization of, I mean, it, yeah, yeah it, we're, we're, we're just sort of, like recreating it, even Altered Carbon, which is brand new, uh, you know, Netflix series, is its visual aesthetic to me is kind of indistinguishable from Blade Runner, right? Mm -hmm. That's strange art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think this fetishization of dystopia is so limiting. To I mean, I I think that all the work here tonight that we're seeing is so important because every time you make something, you're setting the limitations or expanding people's imaginations of what's possible. Hmm. And that's why actually I think the first piece that we saw tonight was so incredible because we're basically saying, you know, imagine this, like imagine a future where there, you know, um, Africa is in charge of its own hmm. resources. Like hmm. I think that, um, you know, to that response to say, oh, that's, you know, Earth's problems will never be solved. I mean, sure, I guess that's, that's realistic, but I do think that as artists, we have responsibility to dare people to imagine solutions. Mm. So I think positive, bringing positive solutions and envisioning positive solutions to the world's problems is kind of a responsibility that I think we all have. I completely agree with you, and I actually think that, I mean, for you know eons, people model themselves after what they see on film and television. And so I think it's the responsibility of producers, studios, to allow people to like spin those narratives. Uh, I really think it's, it's really one of the most high-ranking desires in, in my brain right now. Like, spin yeah. those narratives. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I do. I mean, I, I need to um, draw it to a close now. But I, I, I think it's fantastic to end on that, on on that note. Really, to 
I mean, for, for us, the, the, but, you know, events like tonight and, and, and the program, but also all the work that you do, and that's my massive, uh, massive fanboy of everyone here, is, is just to say that, for the most part, all of these type of projects and journeys through these worlds, is, it, it's really a call to arms, I guess, to, um, to hope that we might all keep making stories as vessels um, for critical ideas, not just for empty, mindless, numbing entertainment. Um, uh, and I think that's the, the real challenge. All right, so thank you so much for, for all Congratulations of you Congratulations to all of you, ladies and to Ian. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course, thanks to all, all the students for an incredible year, um, and to all you guys. I'm, I'm sure you got more than you bargained for this evening. Um, uh, but uh, thanks so much for sticking with us, and, and for everyone that, that, that showed up. We've thinned out a little bit now, but it was a great, um, uh, really unexpected turnout for a, what it essentially is, um, uh, you know, the, the graduate presentation of, 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 of um, some student work. So it's really fantastic um, and a testament to all of your um, amazing ideas. So, so thanks so much for, for, for joining, and joining Alexi and I through that process. Um, uh, and, and again, thanks to you guys. And, and really, um, uh, I can't say this enough, but, but um, uh, you know, work like this, I think, is, is really, really valuable. Um, in many ways, you know, we always talk about this idea that there'd be monsters off the map in, 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 in uncharted territories, and the more um, we imagine speculative new territories, the smaller the places for those monsters to dwell actually start to become. Um, uh, so um, let's keep on going out and making work, and I hope the students that, um, that are finishing this chapter um, uh, continue to go out and make that work, and I uh, hope to see you guys again um, uh, at various points and parts of this, uh, this process as well. So thanks so much, uh, everyone, everyone in the room. Thanks. Thank you.